Right. So uh, today's lecture is called is basically about becoming self sustainable as a programmer. And uh, I think one of the very important things that I've been sort of stressing on since the beginning is sort of let me just switch this off so that no bandwidth issues. And right. So the thing I've been stressing on since the beginning is that we need to learn how to learn new things and sort of get sustainable so that we reach a level from where we can keep building. Um, so I always like to look, uh, sort of look at learning in terms of, you know, almost like making sort of making some progress, uh, being sure of what progress you've made and then making sure that you just stop there to make you to imbibe everything you've learned and then grow from there. So the whole idea here uh, that I want that I want to give you is to give you the tools to be able to learn yourself. And uh, that's the guiding principle behind, you know, the last three lectures and this, this lecture as well. So the first step was sort of learning the basics, uh, the building blocks of Python, lists, functions, dictionaries, read, write, print functions, objects, algorithms, Lego blocks, all the things that we talked about. That was the first two lectures. And we saw some applications of it and we, we saw how it could be used. Uh, the, the second step is sort of learning how to learn. So if you want to do something new, how can you search online? How can you read other people's code? Uh, how can you get over the intimidation that you feel when you see a new piece of code that looks scary and you don't understand? So we talked about some ways in which we can understand code by looking at visualizations of how the code flow is going on or printing things or reading or asking things in Google and things like that. Um, I think the third and the most important step in reusing other people's code online is that when you pick a piece of code from somewhere in the internet and you paste it in the middle of your file, it seldom works directly. It, there was always, there's always going to be some errors and that's because it requires some sort of, you know, tweak, uh, while the logic may be there, the syntax may require changing, or you may change the logic a little bit to get what you want, uh, which brings us to today's class, which is basically about, uh, adapting code for your own use, finding the errors and making it use for your, making it work for your own use. So one thing I realized over the past week or two is that whenever you guys get stuck somewhere, uh, it feels like uh, you don't have the tools to understand why you're stuck. And that can be very frustrating because you keep trying things and nothing makes sense. So today we'll walk through some examples of what's going on. And I'll also give you sort of some more background beyond, uh, you know, what, because right now you've been coding, coding in Colab and that doesn't really explain to you what's going on behind the hood or under the hood. So I'll also try to explain some more along those lines. But uh, subtext for today's class is errors and how do you handle them? That That's the primary uh, problem we'll be tackling today. So, you know, here are some errors and they always look scary. Uh, we know that the scary, the redder they are, the scarier they are. So the scariness of error, error is directly proportional to the amount of redness you see on a screen. And we also know that typically the scarier the error, the easier it is to solve. The hardest errors are actually those where you don't really get much of an error. Uh, you just, you know, there's a short line or there's not even an error sometimes. It's just like, you know, uh, it just doesn't seem to work and you don't know why it's working. That makes it hard. If there is an error code there, there's, so what this, what you see here on the left, the, uh, the red trace back, et cetera, et cetera, it's called an error stack. Uh, that basically shows you what is the stack or what is the flow of the steps that the program was trying to execute and it failed. So by reading this stack, uh, you can understand where it failed. And once you understand where it failed, you can go and correct it. Uh, they, uh, there's a different kinds of errors. We'll talk about them. But the essential idea is that you need to read your error stack and you need to Google the right thing. So for example, on the left, if you see name error, name title is not defined. Uh, here, it's probably easy to catch that there's a typo. What you need to do is you need to convert the title to T-I-T-L-E. But sometimes it's unclear because you may have a really long file. And you know, sometimes you think you made a variable called say X, but it's possible that you may have made a variable called some other name. It could have been called Y or it could have been called Z. And you get lost in say 400, 500 lines. So uh, you get this error and you need to be able to Google this and identify when, when it happens. Uh, that's the primary skill that we're going to look at today. So the whole idea of finding such errors and correcting them uh, is called debugging. And there are lots of different sub parts or, you know, jobs that you do when you do debugging. You, first of all, if you run your code and there's an error, it doesn't work. Then you just have to find your error and correct it to make sure your code runs through. Uh, secondly, if your code is running through, that doesn't mean it's doing the right job. Very often your code will run through because there's no syntactical error, but there may be some error in your logic or there may be some coding error that you made in terms of saving or something of that sort. So you need to go and check that for bugs as well. So you need to check the logic of the code. 
uh, you also need to do something called sanity checks, which is that I wrote a function and you know, suppose I have a function called uh, Pythagoras and I feed in some numbers and I get an output which is negative. Then I know something's off because no triangle can have a side which is negative. Uh, same goes for square. So having certain sanity checks can just make sure that things work fine. So it's just like writing small tests for which uh, you would know the answer and you just check that everything is working fine. Um, it's the most boring part, but it is really the most inter the most important part when you're writing any piece of code that you do some amount of sanity check and check the logic of your code, even if your code is executing through. So you need to write tests and these things. And uh, there's a whole subfield of computer science that talks about tests, but we'll just look at very simple things to make sure that you know our code is working fine. Um, there's also something called try accept, which is a very important technique. Uh, but in the spirit of sort of forcing you to learn how to do things yourself. I'm not going to teach you what try accept is. Um, I will add it to a future assignment probably, uh, but it's a foreshadowing uh, that, you know, it's like a homework assignment in some sense to look up what try accept is. So how to debug in Python? Uh, the first and the most important thing is print every little detail, every little step that goes on, print it and see if the outcome is expected. If you check the printout of a line and the, the behavior is not expected, then there's something off. You probably need to go and read your code to understand. You may even need to Google things to understand how things work. You may even need to search, you know, the, the, the name of the function or the inbuilt function that you're using in Google and see how Python behaves. So try accept is something that is actually very handy when you're debugging things. Um, but I will not go into the detail of how it works. Essentially, all that it allows us to do is that it allows you to try a piece of code. And if that piece of code has an error in it, you can add a second block of code under accept. So just how you have if else, where the first block gets executed if the first condition is met, and if the first condition is not met, uh, the code block below else gets executed. Uh, it's similar here, you have two code blocks, you have a bunch of code below try and a bunch of code below accept. If the try works, works through, that's great. If it doesn't, then it tries to execute the accept. Um, and I'm leaving this as an exercise for you to try out when you will sort of try to debug your code yourself. So the, I think something that I want to do is talk about common error types that people encounter. Now, this is something that honestly, I haven't seen anywhere um, in Python tutorials and I never myself went through this stuff as well, but I think it could be quite useful in helping people not be scared of the errors in the first time. So there's a lot of different kinds of errors in Python uh, and they look like this syntax error, index error. There's a different, there's a bunch of different kinds and um, it's, it's helpful to know what's going on, why is there an error? So when you see this, I'm, I'm sure what you're going through is one of these memes where you know you don't understand any of these words and it's very confusing. So we'll try to walk through each of these one by one in this class. Uh, we'll start with the module not found error because I'm also going to use these as headers for more important things I want to talk to you. So the module not found error um, typically happens when you don't have a module installed. So we saw that when you don't have a module installed, you use pip, uh, pip installed, package name. So, you know, this could be pip install numpy, pip install beautiful soup. Uh, some of the packages come pre or packages or modules, uh, they use synonymously. They come pre-installed in Python. Uh, if they're not pre-installed, then you have to install them using pip. So the first question is, you know, what is pip? Uh, pip is, you can think of this, it's, a, it's called a Python uh, package installer, but essentially the idea is that you can think of it as a program that comes with Python, uh, which makes it easy for you to get new packages. So whenever someone makes a new package or a module, so you could make your own module. I can make my own module. It's open source. People make their own modules and they put it online on a repository, on a, on a big database where everybody's uh, modules are available for free. So if anybody wants to use my module, they can just download it using pip. So that way it's just, you know, a shared repository of code, which people can use. And where do you run pip? Because I think there was a question that I saw on GitHub where uh, I think Devanshu you tried to, run pip install uh, beautiful soup and it was giving me an error. So I, I believe that, first of all, I have a question uh, for the one should, uh, did this, were you trying to run this code outside Colab or were you trying to run this on Colab? On Colab. Okay, that's a little surprising because, uh, so the thing is that pip install uh, package name is not something that's run inside a Python file. It's supposed to be run outside a Python file. Uh, where Python files are run. So the way Colab works is that uh, Colab has a computer on the cloud 
um, which has all the dependencies for Python and all the packages and pip already installed. And you only get to see the, the interface of, you know, writing Python code. But in the back end, uh, that Python code is being executed on a computer. And when I say it's being executed on a computer, uh, it's being run on something called a shell. Um, if you have a Mac or if you've ever seen a Linux, you would be familiar with something called terminal. And if you have a Windows, you would be familiar with something called Windows or command prompt. Uh, it's typically a very ugly looking black screen with white or green text on it. And that's what, you know, movies use to show if you're a, if you're a hacker, you're supposed to be typing on one of those screens and doing things like robbing banks or whatever. But the point is that, um, if you have ever seen a black screen with white, ugly looking code on it, that's usually a shell that you're typing in. Um, and a shell, let's not go into the details of how a shell works, but essentially you can think of it as a program which communicates, takes Python and runs it on your computer. Uh, so everything on your computer ultimately gets converted down to bits, ones and zeros, transistors running on the hardware. Something, someone has to do that. Some program has to do that. And the shell or the, or, or, you know, the command prompt or terminal is one of those uh, pieces uh, that you have to interact with to make this happen. So you run pip in a shell usually. Um, if you run it in a collab notebook, uh, from what I saw, it actually works if you cite, type pip install package name. Um, typically, if you're trying to run in something like a Jupyter notebook or a collab notebook, you need to add an exclamation mark instead of pip to make it work because that tells the, the, the collab or Jupyter notebook that you don't, this is not a Python command, run it in the shell outside. So it would run that command in the shell outside instead of running it inside the Python file. Uh, does that make sense? Or is that too much abstraction? That, if that's confusing, I, I can explain that. Should, I'll probably try it once. Um, so, so basically I have to alter the syntax. Uh, the yeah. Habit, you, so that it, if you uh, add an exclamation mark instead of, instead of pip, uh, so it becomes exclamation mark pip install package name, that should go through. Um, but I think Colab already comes pre, uh, like it comes installed with the beautiful soup should, you should be fine. If not, you can install it like that. But the reason I yeah, wanted to go over this route yeah. was because I wanted to explain what's happening behind Colab. And, uh, another reason this is uh, that I want to talk about this is because I want to sort of, uh, help you migrate beyond Colab and sort of be able to run things on your own machines. So you would have realized that if you upload a file on Colab and you close it, you come back, you have to upload the file again. Um, that's not very convenient, of course. And that's not how people code. Uh, if you save a file, where do you save it? If you write a file, all of those things. So it becomes much more easier if you're keeping your code on your own computer. And you know, if you're a Linux user, your, your life is quite easy. Um, I don't think anybody in, in the group today is a Linux user because Linux is mostly used by people who already code. If you're a Mac user, again, your life is at least could seem like it's easy. It won't be very easy. Uh, Mac pretends to be like Linux sometimes, uh, and that's nice. Uh, Windows users, you will be having a hard time for the first two, three days. If you're not convenient, if you're not comfortable with command prompt and all these things, it's a little bit of a pain. Um, but I think now over the years, it's gotten easier. Uh, they've made it much more easy for people to install Python, pip, etc., on your machine. But uh, what we will talk about briefly is how do you install Python on your own computer? So uh, Linux and Mac, open the terminal app, uh, just type Python and press enter. It already comes installed with Python. And then you can write the code the same way as you write in Google Colab. You can just write the same, you can write import NumPy, you know, you can declare a list, uh, you can get its mean the same way as you write in Colab. Uh, if you have Windows, then you have to install Python. Uh, it's as easy as just, you know, downloading a file, double clicking and following the installer, just saying, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here I've added a link for people to go and install Python and also you will need to install pip because Python doesn't come pre-installed with like neither Mac nor windows, uh, comes pre-installed with pip. So to be able to be able to install your own packages, you would probably need to install pip. And, uh, this will be a little bit of a pain, but I think it's something that they have, uh, given very detailed instructions for online. So you shouldn't have any problems as such. Uh, if you do, then, you know, you can probably post on the GitHub page as a, as an issue and we can look at it together. But yeah, so the, the important question is where do I type what, where do I type everything? And the answer is, uh, you write your code. Um, if you're not working on Colab, you would write your code in a file editor, you know, notepad is a file editor, but you probably don't want to use it because it's not meant for writing program. 
Um, uh, there's other ones called Atom, Sublime Text. I like to use Atom myself. Um, and I'll show you Atom in a little bit. Um, but basically, it makes it makes your life very easy when you're coding. Um, though Colab isn't very bad either. It's just that it's not a very stable solution because it's online. Um, and you run your code in a shell, in command prompt or you know Windows or terminal if you don't Mac or Linux. So just to give you a quick demo of how this works, uh, let's open. So I have this uh, shell open. Can you guys see my screen? Hello, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it says bash 4.2, which tells you that this is a, a bash shell. There's a different kinds of shells. This one's bash. If I type in Python and I enter here, uh, it tells me I'm on Python 2.7 uh, and I can now you know, work the same way as you do online. So I import NumPy, I can say A equals one, two, three, and I can say NP mean A. It's the same. Um, okay, that's because I did this. Uh, also, does is this something we've talked? I don't think we've talked about the as part here. So when I say import NumPy as NP, it just says that import this file, and I'm giving it this name NP, uh, so that in the future I can just say NP dot mean instead of NumPy dot mean every time. Uh, that's just meant for ease of coding, and sometimes there might be packages that sort of clash with each other in terms of names. So you may want to differentiate between them uh, by using the as syntax. Right. So. Um, here is, you know, this, the script that I wrote to scrape the that we talked about earlier. Um, and I, we won't go into the detail of this today, but this is what Atom looks like. And you can see that it's, you know, it's nicely colored and uh, it does good things. Like if you have something written here, it might auto complete things for you. So if I say with open and it'll give, it'll give you, you know, names of packages and things like that. So it's just easier to write, uh, to write in something like this as compared to something like notepad, which will not have colors for different uh, things like variables and uh, variable names, if else, etc. So yeah, if you want to run a script, a Python script, what I would do is that I would just say, you know, I would go to my desktop. This is me going to my desktop and then I would say Python and I would type and I would press enter. When I press enter, it will just basically run the code. Uh, the difference between this and Colab is that in Colab you write, you have cells and you have, a, you can, you know, write a bunch of uh, code and you can run that and then you can do more stuff and you can run again. Here, the whole script gets run as a single uh, step and that may, that is not very helpful when you're trying to, you know, play with your code, but it's very helpful when you're running lots of code uh, in, in, you know, in, in large, if you're running like 10 files and you just want to run them one by one, it's easier for you to just launch it like this as opposed to playing with your code one by one. And it's also, it just prevents errors. It's just how people code when they are going beyond the playground state in some sense. Right, so the question that we haven't talked about is how does pip work? So what is pip? We talked about pip being this package installer. Um, and as we remember talking about, everything is a file basically, um, and a file's path must be given. So when you install pip, you actually have to let your shell know where pip is because your shell looks for pip in a, in a bunch of places. So uh, it can't look inside every folder in your computer because there's too many. Uh, if you ask it to look for things everywhere, it'll take forever. So you need to specify in your, your computer where pip is. And when you install pip, you will already see this. Uh, it will be a part of the online steps that you execute. They, they'll say add pip to path. So path is just uh, a list of locations where your computer look for, looks for things. And it's just something like path equals, it's a list of location names. And when you add something to your path, you just add one more thing to the, to the list, that's it. It sounds a little scary in the beginning, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so once you have pip installed and you have added it to the path of your computer, uh, then you can use pip install package name on your computer and it will not give you an error. And just as a reminder, modules are also files. So it's just pieces of code in Python stored somewhere else. It's typically in a, in a, it's stored inside your Python folders in the computer and you can import it from there. Um, when you say import NumPy, the computer knows where to go and look for packages that have been installed using pip and that's how pip works. 
So coming back, uh, module not found error is basically when you import a module that you have installed, it's going to give you an error. So if you do this, it should take care of the error and that should be fine. So that was a very long drawn out discussion on uh, module not found error, but I, I just want to make sure that you guys aren't scared of installing these things in a computer because you might need to um, in the later half of the class. Right, so some of the error, the most common errors that you come across is called a syntax error. Typically it's just a missing comma, bracket, quote, things like that. So if you use equal to instead of double equal to, it'll give you an error. Uh, if you do a misprint, something like, you know, if you're typing fast, sometimes instead of print, you just make a typo that gives you an error. Um, you want to look for a line number and this symbol, which is called a caret symbol. Um, and if, if you see the error stack, you'll actually tell, it'll tell you which line number it's, it's on. It will say syntax error, line number, and it'll also give you a caret showing where the syntax error is. So it's very helpful. Uh, for example, if I was to execute any of these lines, uh, this would give you an error because uh, print should have a parenthesis, like a bracket bit, uh, between the word print and the, num that, and the string you're trying to print. Same in, in, in the next line, there is one bracket missing in the end. And this seems like something that's, you know, a dumb error, but it happens all the time. Missing brackets is probably one of the biggest errors that you have when you're coding or missing quotes, missing, you know, typo errors, things like that. So this is the easiest of all to find and to correct. Uh, the next are index error and key error, which are very much like each other. Uh, one talks about lists. So if you have a list like A equals one, two, three, and you say print A zero, it's gonna print out one. If you do print A one, it's gonna give you two. Uh, quick reminder, in Python, counting starts from zero. That's why it's, if you ask for the zeroth element, it gives you one. But if you ask for three, uh, there is no element three in this list. It's only element zero, one, two. Uh, so it's just gonna give you an index error saying that index three does not exist in this list. And that just tells you that, you know, you're trying to index at a wrong location. So there's probably some coding error or probably some other logic error. Same goes for keys, uh, key errors. Key error is the counterpart for dictionary. So I create this dictionary and I give just called country number and I give India one and USA two. And I ask for India, it's going to give me one. But if I ask for Canada, it's going to give me a key error saying that key Canada not found in this, in this dictionary. And if you see this, you know that you're trying to look for something which doesn't exist inside the dictionary or inside the list. So these kind of errors, um, I, I've actually seen a bunch of you struggle with this before. So I think that if you see this the next time, now you would know why it's happening. Uh, yeah, and the next kind of error is a type error. Uh, if you take two strings and you add them like hello and bye, it just you know sort of sticks them right next to each other, which is called concatenation. So it concatenates a hello and by to make it hello by. Uh, but if you do A plus C in this case, you're trying to add a number and a, and a string. That's gonna give you a type error. The error is going to be longer than just type error. But uh, the important part here is that every, every error contains in it multiple things. The error stack first shows you what was the chain of commands it was trying to execute. We'll take, it, take a look at it in the next few slides. Then it gives you the type of error you've encountered. And then it tells you where did you encounter that error. So another kind of error is indentation error. In Python, indentation defines where things in begin. So which block uh, begin and end, like which block of code, say if you have a for loop like this, <coughs> and if you say employee name equals one, and if you say for i in this range, print i, you know that's gonna print uh, one to 10, like zero to nine in this case. But because employee name is also inside the for loop, it's actually going to print that along with it. So the output is going to be zero, ABC, one, ABC, two, ABC. If you want that print statement to be out of the loop, you need to write it like this. <coughs> so oftentimes we mess up the indentation and there's an error because of that. And that's called an indentation error. Uh, there's something called name error, which seems very benign at the start of it, but it's going to lead us into the second more important part of the lecture. Um, here, if I say that, you know, something like this, and I try to print, so the, the one, the example above has a typo. I'm sorry about that, but just look at the example below. Uh, if you say X var equals one, and you try to print X, it's just going to say that X variable not found or it's just going to say name error. This variable does not exist. That's because you never declared it. And it happens all the time where you declare uh, a variable with that name. And then you try to print a variable with some other name that you thought you declared the variable with before. Um, but another very sort of important place where this happens 
uh, is because of variable scoping. And this is going to talk a little bit about something we talked, we sort of alluded to in the previous lecture. And I also saw some people struggle with this in the assignment. So I thought this would be a good time to talk about variable scope. Um, <clears throat> essentially, if you take a look at this code here, um, I define a list here and then I have a function called number range, which just takes this uh, list of numbers and then it gives me the range. So the max minus min and inside the function, what I'm doing is I take the, I store the maximum value. I store the minimum value. I subtract them and I return that. Now, if I try to print num range, uh, what do you think will happen? Are there any suggestions or any answers? What do you guys, what do you guys think will happen? Does anybody want to volunteer an answer? Um, I think it might give an indentation error because your num range is within the function and return is also within the function. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I could make it work by putting the print statement inside the function as well. And that would, that would have been an indentation error. But in this case, it's actually going to give me a different error. It's going to give me, um, because it's not an indentation error. It just assumes that the function ended. And that's not an indentation error. Um, it's, so when I gave you an example of indentations before, I, was, I'm, I think it was probably not the best example because I didn't give you an example for the error itself. I was just giving you an example of how you could make an error with indentation by moving things around. Um, in this case, there is no error per se in terms of indentation because the, the computer doesn't know you wanted to print it inside. It's just gonna try to finish the function and then it's gonna try to print num range. The problem is that this variable does not exist outside the function. It was created inside the function. And once the function ended, like in terms of execution, uh, once the program has moved on bit, again, ahead of the function, it's just not going to find num range. It won't be able to find num range. It's gonna say name error, variable not found. Uh, and that's what you see here. You know, I basically copy pasted this code to the Python shell that I showed you before. And it gives me this error, name error, num range is not defined. That's because I never created the variable outside the scope of the function. Uh, whatever you make inside the function stays inside and is not accessible from outside the function. You can think of it as a container and anything that you, that you want to come out of the container has to be returned using a return function. Uh, here we return num range, but we haven't captured that output anywhere. So what we need to do is we need to basically say something like, output equals number range bracket num list. And then the returned value will get stored in an output and we can print that. That's how we've been doing it so far. If you, if you go and look up your code, uh, that's because things that you define inside are actually not available outside. So variables declared in the function can't be used outside unless passed appropriately. What that means is that unless I pass it outside appropriately using a return statement, it's not going to work. So, if I do this, it'll work. I take return num range as an output and I print that, that'll work. And as you can see, it did work when I copy pasted this code. Uh, so scope, you can think of it as access hierarchy. So if you create an object, is it, where is it accessible from? Uh, there's four different kinds of scopes in, in, in Python and it looks like this. Uh, this sounds scary, but I'll go over each of these one by one so it won't be very scary. Uh, local scope is basically something that you make inside a function. Uh, it's only available inside the function. Enclosing is if you nest function, so you can also create a function inside a function. Uh, that's perfectly allowed in, in Python. Um, if you do that, so if, if you have function one and inside that you create def function two, anything that you made inside function one will be available inside function two, but the other way around will not be the case. Uh, there's something called global, which basically is like, you know, it's available everywhere in your program. So if you make a global variable outside, you can access it from inside the function. If you make a global variable inside a function, you can still access it from outside. Uh, the important thing is that if you make a variable outside a function, you can still access it inside the function, but it doesn't work the other way around. And the top level is, is you know, built in stuff that comes in with Python, like sorted, max, float. So this sort of piece of code explains what's going on. Uh, Outside any function is the global scope. So if I say x equals zero outside, it's accessible everywhere. And then I make this enclosed scope, which is, you know, outer def, def outer. Uh, if I declare anything inside there, I can still use x equals zero here. Um, 
but x equals one can't be accessed in the inner. Uh, sorry, x equals two can't be accessed in the in the layer outside, and x equals one can't be accessed outside the whole nested function. And that's something that happens very often uh, when we start out coding. Um, and it's something that you should sort of, you know, get a good idea of when you, if you try to go back and see you know, some of the old errors, you find it. So if you see here, this is another example of the same thing. Uh, you declare things outside and inside, and you can access them depending upon scopes. So that's something that, you know, you can sort of rush right now because I want to move to the coding part, but uh, this example, you can take a look at it in, in your own time and, see, and ask me if you have any doubts. Right. So let's actually try to debug some code that we've seen and try to understand how do you do this in practice. Um, if there's any questions about the slides, I can take them quickly before I move on to the code. Great. So since there's no questions, we'll move on to the code. Uh, right. So this is talking about the answer question. If I do this, it actually goes through in the case of um, Colab, which is, oh, it's still connecting here. See, this is something that you don't need to struggle with if you install stuff on your own machines. Um, you don't need to wait for connecting and you can also work offline and things like that. You don't need to be connected to the internet because we are still waiting for connecting. <laughs> um, okay. There you go. So, this seems to work, which is why I was a little surprised uh, when the one you mentioned there was an error. But if you have an error, you can use this and this should, I'm pretty sure this will work. If not, um, I, I really have to look into why it's not working, but I don't expect this to not work. Right, so debugging a function. Let's, let's take a look at this function that I think Rachi was, uh, she shared with me and she was having some troubles understanding what's going on in this function. So, uh, this is me directly copy pasting her code and you can see here is that it says name error, name song, song information not defined. Uh, now we know that what this means is that there's some problem with this thing. So we go up, see here, and we realize that it's called songs information. And that's a typo error where this function was never defined. The function that we defined was called songs information and the error is because there's a typo here. So if we do this, this should work fine. Yeah, that works fine. Now, sometimes what, what, you, what you struggle with is that there's too much output and you, know, you may not want to see all of this output. So this is something that I wanted to quickly go over uh, is that you can add something called a break statement in a for loop, which allows you to break it where it is right now. So here what I say is I start with printed equals zero. I loop over all the A tags in this page and I, every time I get a new element and I print it, I increment the value of this variable. And I say as soon as five, it has reached five, which means that I've printed five different elements break, which means exit out of the for loop, even if you can loop over more things here. So if I was to do a for I in range thousand and I break at after five elements, it will stop after executing I equals four, like zero, one, two, three, four. It will not go till nine, nine, nine. Uh, yeah. So if I do this and I rerun the program, it's going to stop after printing five things. And this could be useful sometimes in terms of, you know, debugging if there's too many, too much output going on. Um, another interesting thing I saw was here. If I again, copy paste the code, I have this and I have this function called get information, which is again, trying to scrape the lyrics and I prove and I type get in. Okay. I see another error here. Uh, this time it says it's a syntax error. Uh, and now I know that, you know, it says I'm here in line four and something's wrong around here. There's a syntax error. If I go up here, I will see that what I need to do is I need an L if instead of LP. Uh, and that happens when you're typing fast, these things happen all the time. If you run it, it's gonna go, it's gonna go through. So that's what, that's what correcting a syntax error looks like. Um, and now if I run this, it should hopefully, hopefully go through. And if I print info, it's gonna print out all that stuff. Um, Okay, let's try to see one of these links that it's found. So if you remember from the last class, we tried to get the name of this artist uh, from this website. And then we scraped all the song names on this website. So I've opened this song, I will see that it's a song by Eminem. While we were trying to get a song by Steven Wilson, and we've actually passed in Steven Wilson. So what should be happening here is that 
this should be working. Um, something's off. So if I try to, let's, let's do this. Let's print name and see what's going on. So Stephen Wilson. So the right name has been passed, but there's something off. Let's try to go in and say, maybe after the if else block, we say, what is the value of? All right, it seems like it's working fine. Does anybody have any idea of what's going wrong here? Any suggestions, any comments? Okay. So what's happening here is something that happens very often is that you, you, are, you, you can always access stuff from outside inside. So you created this thing here where you read in m and the page for m and You created this loop object which contains all the information for m and here. Here all that you've done is you've changed the file path but you forgot to do this part again. Uh, what happens is that when you are, you can set the file path and you need to access, you need to again scrape the page. Uh, you've already done this and you can again access this code here. So anything that's changing here is not leading to any change in this object because you never ran this again. So if you were to do this here, now you would pass in file path here. Now this should work fine. Now if I look for Steven Wilson, I believe it should give me songs for Steven Wilson. Let's try to find out if we have corrected it or not. Right, so we have, we did get a song by Steven Wilson. So this is an error that actually happens very often and I'm not sure if, you know, so this was originally given to me by Rajshree, I'm not sure if she's been able to if she was able to identify this header and get beyond it, but I'm sure that a lot of people do struggle with it. So it's very important to understand that whatever you create outside is accessible inside. Uh, one good practice that I use is that I never reuse variable names inside functions and outside. Uh, that's just a pra pra coding practice that prevents such errors because all the, all the variable names that are using inside the function are never used outside and all the ones made outside the function never used inside a function. That just makes things easier in terms of uh, preventing bugs. So that's great. We've sorted this one error. And let's look at another example of uh, scoping that was given to us by Anna. Um, so she had this function where she was trying to do this. And then she was trying to read the file. Uh, there's a couple of errors here. One, the error is that this variable is no longer accessible outside. That's a scoping error. Um, the second thing is that you need to return things from the function to be able to access them outside. So what you would need to do is something here called return file path. If you, if you want to, you can also print it out here just for your own sake. Uh, and now you can say file path for user and you know, you could call country source and now you could pass in India or Canada and now it should work. Uh, so I haven't uploaded the file, the COVID file in this, in this uh, collab notebook. So this will not work, but you'll see the error changes. It won't say file path is not fine. It's probably going to say something like file not found. Oh, okay. Okay. That's because I re so here's another example of the same problem. Again, um, I changed the variable name. I forgot to change it. That's something you need to sort of keep track of. Great. So the error changed. It says no such file or directory. That's because we don't have the file uploaded right now, but we already know how to upload a file and you know, that's something that can be corrected easily. But this brings us to sort of the most important topic, which is, you know, how do you think about debugging a, bun a bunch of code in general? We saw a lot of tricks here, but what, what is the general process to prevent, to sort of correct um, any error that you come across? So, one thing is to know your errors, you know, be able to search them online and be able to sort of correct them. Uh, the second thing is use a lot of print statements, print everything. So here is a very heavily annotated version of this, what you have here. 
And this would make sure that when I run it, I would understand every little line of code here. So let's try to run this and see what we get. Uh, this tells me the user passed in Steven Wilson. That's here. It tells me name was equal to Steven Wilson. So I'm executing the elif block. And file path has been set to. So this seems like a funny line. Why did I set this? I could have just set this to file path has been set to because that would be grammatically correct, right? But never have two different print statements inside the same bunch of code because it will make it will just be harder for you to track which one it was. So doesn't matter if it's something nonsensical even. It could just do like this and it's fine. You know, it's easier to add more English just so that it's easier for you to track, keep track of it in terms of your code flow. But print everything, especially in terms of blocks. When you go inside, you know, if else blocks, it's very easy for you to say, see which, which it's very important for you to see which one was triggered if you pass a certain variable. For example, you know, here's one error that could happen. Say, <clears throat> I have defined something called a variable here and I'm just making up this error, but you know, it happens. Such things happen. Maybe I have something called artist name. I'm playing with my code and I define something called artist name and I come here and now inside the, in that, inside this code, when I sort of, you know, over different versions or iterations of the code while making corrections, instead of checking for name, which I should have, which is what is passed here, I could just have this. I could have done this error while coding up because such things happen. And now, even if I pass in Steven Wilson, it is still going to, it's still going to trigger this block. And I would see that there's something off and I would come here and I would see, all right, that doesn't make any sense. I clearly passed in Steven Wilson and it says user passed in Steven Wilson, yet it triggered this block of code. And I'm going to see what's happening here and I will find out that I need to have name instead of artist name here. So heavily annotating, heavily printing. Uh, and if you go over each of these lines, now you have the skill set to understand each of these lines. You know that this is a print statement. You know that this is just a string that will print as is. You know that this is a variable. You know that the value for this variable is defined depending upon what you pass inside the function, which is passed when you call this function. You, you know that this is an equal to equal to sign means that it's checking if this is equal to this. Uh, you know that if this condition holds true, then it executes this block of code. If it executes this block of code, again, a string, you realize that this is a single equal to, which means that this is setting the value of this variable as this value. Then you're again printing a string and you're printing this variable, which has been set here or declared here. So this is all stuff that, you know, we've gone over multiple times in the previous lecture and there's a lot. So I know that some of it may be a little new or intimidating to you, but I'm sure it sounds like stuff you've heard before. So if you probably rewatch the lectures, uh, it'll start making sense over time. Uh, and this sort of, I would say, uh, showcases that all of the things, the basics that you've learned, how useful it can be when you try to write some new code to do something like, you know, scrape breaks online. Uh, and that's why it helps to really understand the basics of how code flows. Uh, are there any questions about this? Great. So this brings us to sort of the last quick re example that I want to give. I just wanted to quickly drill the idea of break in, into your minds once again, uh, because this happens very often that you're looping over a very long sort of like, you know, uh, script or a very long list. And there's a lot, there's some complicated code here and you need to check what's going on inside here. So you don't want to run the for loop for all. You can just say, you know, when I do this, when this code starts executing, it's going to set I equal to zero. It's going to execute this code. And then it's going to go back up with I increased. And then it's going to go back up with I increased. And it's going to keep going till I hits nine, 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 nine in this case. But if I set I equals one, if I equals one break, then it's just going to break. And you know, I could set this to I equals two and it'll break. Potentially I could remove the if statement. I can just say break and that is going to exit after the first time it gets executed. Uh, and this is something that I personally use all the time for debugging code. Uh, in fact, 30, like 30 minutes before the class, I was trying to do, do the same thing with uh, a program that's running on a bunch of files on, on, my, on a bunch of images. And I want to make sure how, how it works with one image before I run it on all images. 
So this is something specifically for the assignment. You may want to use it because when uh, say you have a function for scraping the list of all song URLs for a particular artist like Eminem. Uh, now you want, you have another function which goes onto that page and scrapes the text from that page. So you may not want to run the, the loop over all song URLs. To check if it works for one page, if it gets text from one page, you could use the break statement to make sure it works for one page before you run it for all pages. Just to make sure there's no errors there. Um, yeah, so here's, you know, there's one more tool that I've left out. It looks like this, it's called try accept. And you know, this. So maybe I'll just quickly explain that, you know, there's code block one here and there's code block two. When I say block, that basically means a bunch of lines. And what it tries to do, it tries to run block one. It tries to run it. And if it runs into any errors and it can't execute it, then it executes the accept block. It tries. And if it doesn't work out, then it, it does this accept. Uh, there are other variations of the try accept. This try accept else, try accept finally, all that complicated stuff. Uh, but for now, just look up how try accept works. Uh, it's going to be useful, trust me. And it's something that you should know if you're trying to debug your code. Yeah, that's basically all the code that I have for today. Uh, but I do want to sort of quickly go over uh, some more, you know, cursory, like sort of important details. Um, as a conclusion, I think uh, if you want to, you can try setting up Python and paper on your computer. Uh, it'll be a little frustrating. Uh, bear with, you know, us, just bear with it. Go ahead with it. Um, it's nicer to migrate out of Colab because Colab is not very stable. We need to keep waiting for connecting, upload files again, need the internet, all that stuff. And print, debug, print more. Even if your code is working, print. Just print to make sure your logic is fine. And that's something that I can't stress enough. Uh, what you can do is you could delete those print statements after once you know your code is working. There are other more complicated things. Uh, you could you could write your script in a debug setting and you can, you know, save it in a non debug setting. Once it's done, let's not go into that right now, but essentially for now, print everything that you can to make sure everything is working. Right. So, um, I'll talk about the final project briefly, but I mean, this is basically where we stop the class today. So if there's any questions, I can take them before we talk about the final project details. Great. So I hope that today's class was helpful in terms of helping you guys with, you know, previous problems you've encountered and it'll help you sort of reuse code that's available online on the internet by making sense of it and debugging it for your own use case. Um, and I think this is going to be one of the most important skill for you when you start working on your final project. So what I'm going to do is that this week there's going to be no assignment. Uh, this week is sort of for you to go back and add print statements to all the old code that you've written. If you're lagging behind a little bit, that's perfectly okay. You can do the assignments now and you can catch up with the, with the others. And this is a good time to sort of like, you know, brush up everything. And also I'm going to have no, no class next week because I want to sort of give you guys time to uh, sort of come to terms with the speed, with the, with the content and just get, get used to it. And I also want you to think about what project you're going to work on. You can go and look up the content once again, and you can think about different project ideas. So we'll have the next class on June 6th. And uh, basically what I want from everybody is a five slide PPT on your project. Uh, we won't probably present them in the class because we'll be short of time. And we have to fulfill Gaurav's uh, uh, idea that he suggested, uh, which we'll talk about in the next two classes, which is how do you scrape, uh, once you scrape this data, how do you use it to compare two different music artists or how do you, sort of do text processing plus uh, data analysis in some sense, a quick primer to NumPy and to uh, text processing, because that might be useful to people for the projects as well. So the next two classes will be June 6th and uh, the one after that, so that will be June 13th, will be sort of a quick introduction to a very quick introduction to data science. Uh, I would say just 20 minutes of what data science is, um, text processing, uh, also called natural language processing, lot of different names, the same thing. And we'll use that to make sense of, you know, how different artists compare, music artists compare. Um, in the process, we also learn how to process numbers in Python using NumPy, which might be very useful to people who work in slightly more technical fields. So given the, you know, the sort of the class composition, I know that some people 
came for the technical skills of numbers, handling numbers. Some people came for the technical skills of handling text. So that's why I want to add both of these together in the last two lectures as a sort of single unit in two lectures. Uh, but maybe you guys can come back with a final project idea on June 6th. Uh, you can take this time to revise and think. And once we're done with the classes on June 13th, uh, you can take the rest of that month to wrap up your project and we hopefully have a collection of projects done by the end, end of June, uh, which we can, you know, sort of the use or like present later on, on, on the GitHub page. Uh, but the general idea is that we've learned a lot of new skills and I want you guys to use what you've learned to build something that is useful in your own work. So if you work with genomics, build a, a quick tool that does something that you do very often in genomics. Uh, if you work with, with uh, documents, uh, maybe make a quick program that does something to those documents. Um, that's the essential idea that we have here. And I, I, I'm really looking forward to the project ideas you guys have because that's one of my biggest motivation for uh, sort of taking this class to see what people can do with this stuff that I teach. Um, as a quick shout out to this website, that could be a good idea for you guys to play with in some sense. Um, there's something called automating boring stuff with Python. Uh, this is a pretty cool website and it also talks through talks about the basics. So if you want to go and check out the basics, you can also just check them here, but essentially chapter 11 on 12 onwards, you know, there's just inter interesting ideas that may be useful. For example, web scraping is useful for some, uh, some may find it useful to set up these scheduled tasks. For example, say you want to remind yourself every day to do some task. I don't know, do exercise or something. And you want to do what the reminders app on your phone or your laptop does. And you can do that yourself. You can send yourself an email. You can automate things. You can send emails using Python. Uh, you can manipulate images. You can do things with images. Uh, there's a bunch of different things that you can do. And this is a good place to sort of explore some ideas that you can do with Python. Um, if you would like a slightly more data science project, then I guess you can drop me a message and I can suggest you. Uh, of course, you're free to go and Google interesting ideas and come back with that as well. So yeah, that's, that's basically all that I have for today. So if there's any questions, I can take them. Uh, if not, we can meet next, next week.